episode of the Santa's and Chronicles. I'm your host Maureen and this one is probably going to be a little on the shorter side today. Not because the character is not worthy of our time, not because the acting is bad, not because of any nefarious reason other than I did not get to record this last Sunday like I wanted to. So you notice I have changed. I am in different clothes. Um, but because it is almost midnight <laughs> when I'm recording this and um, I have children and a job <laughs> which coincidentally is podcasting still so this might be a little on the shorter side I apologize about that I'm going to make it as in-depth and detailed as I can now someone did point out to me that uh, Edward is not a lord and that's that is right because Lord Denham kept sounding wrong and I couldn't figure out why and again like I was I had five podcasts to do that day. So um, it is Sir Edward and Lady Denham. Lady Denham is, of course, the old Lady Denham. So uh, he is, Edward is not a lord, but oh, by the way, that's who we're talking about today is Sir Edward Denham. <laughs> um, I have talked a little bit about him in our relationship conversation with Clara and our relationship conversation with Esther so um, that's the other reason it might be a little short today is because we've already kind of talked a lot about his character and who he is. Now one thing I wish we saw more of is why Edward is the way he is, why he functions the way he does, why he reacts to things the way he reacts to them, why he just generally why is he the way he is? What is he doing that is um, that has caused him to be this way? What was his upbringing like? What was his father like? What was his mother like? I'm very curious to hear about that. Um, and again, this is not always accurate, but I wonder if maybe his mother died in childbirth and that's why he is the only son and that's why his dad married so quickly. I mean, obviously a man wanted a husband or a wife, I mean, but I'm, I'm just curious, not because I think anything was given away to that, but I'm curious if that was the route they went. So growing up motherless, maybe his father was a little hard on him and he didn't have that compassion gene necessarily. He didn't have uh, a mother really to show him how to have that softer side and maybe his dad was rather hard and that is why he kind of got away with himself or got away with whatever he did however he wanted to do it um, maybe his father indulged him because he's a boy and he was his heir and he had no spare so um you know I'm, i just i'm curious about that I, I wonder what made edward the man he was because like i've said before Edward is hilarious <laughs> at times. Obviously not all the time. Obviously there are things he does that are not okay, that are sketchy, that are dangerous, that are repulsive, that are abusive. He does all those things for sure. But then he has those moments of, of wit that are funny and entertaining and I don't know, you just like to see him on screen sometimes, you know? There's episode one where he is um, is one of my two favorite scenes with him in it. Um, and there's, there's not, it's not really dialogue. It's just Jack Fox being Edward, <laughs> but it's in the ball when he's, he, it's right after he's, or he's in the middle of dancing with Charlotte and he, it's, this is the one I know he had an ankle injury. Um, he got one on set. So it was that scene where he's dancing around and he, um, he does like this little thing. It's not where he's flapping his arms and flying away, which a lot of people point out to him, but it's after he's, he and Charlotte are just about to separate. He kind of goes with his arms and it's just it's all upper body and he's got like this smirk on his face and his like shoulders do like this little kind of like nerdy walk thing um i don't know if you ever watched the Gilmore girls but there's a scene where um in episode or season four when rory's going to college and she's like do the going to college walk and it's like this and that's kind of that's what it makes me think when, when edward is doing that and i love it it makes me laugh out loud every single time and of course there is the bird flapping dance that makes me laugh and there's also other moments of dialogue, and I pointed this out several times on this podcast, but the one where Clara says at Lady Denham's house, roughly, I'm paraphrasing, I rather thought no one could have compared to you, brother. And he says, mm, that's a fair point, I grant you. Like, that, it's just funny. He's witty. And I know the description, well, I believe I, I saw Jack Fox say the description was Edward is a lovable cad. So he had to play that off with some charisma. He had to... 
he had to give Edward some sense of likability or he wouldn't be doing his job. So Edward does have that, but that's what makes the viewers, or at least me, I don't know how you feel about it, but it makes me confused because I love when Edward's on the screen. I, I think he's, my eyes are kind of drawn to him when he's, on, when he's on the screen, not because, oh, I love Jack Fox, not because of any, not because of that feeling towards Edward, but just because he's a character that you love to watch what's gonna come out next. And I think that's right down to good acting and good writing that his character is written in such a way that he has these opportunities to um, be carefree, to be, uh, eh, who cares what people think? Because one, he's a man. Two, he comes from a good family. Um, and so there's that aspect of it. And so we do see that, um, there's a hair in my mouth. <laughs> we do see that he, he does have those moments of levity. He does have those moments of wit. He does have those moments where it's, Kind of like, ooh, that's naughty. But you forget he's so good at what he does. Jack Fox is so good at inputting that into Edward and making him charismatic and making him, at least in some portion, likable that you almost forget how terrible he is until he does something like when Esther comes back from a walk with Paddington and he says, I can make you feel so much more than laughter. And he kisses her, but then he has that evil, evil look on his face after he's done. And it's those moments you're like, oh yeah, this guy, I'm not supposed to like him. I'm not supposed to like him. And you kind of like have to repeat it over and over to yourself. Because Jack Fox does a fantastic job. He, it's, it's a credit to what he does. It's a credit to his abilities that he can make you like this character and forget that he's not good. Now there are moments, of course, like in episode one, when he and Charlotte are walking <laughs> along the pier. And oh boy, with that conversation. Oh my gosh. Oh boy, would that conversation have made me very uncomfortable. When he's talking about sea bathing, and he's like, to view the... Oh, crap. I'm going to paraphrase it again and adding some of his real dialogue, but he says, to feel the way he's lapping at your naked limbs. <laughs> like, he's obviously choosing words that are going to make her uncomfortable. He's obviously choosing a language that, A, are going to make her uncomfortable, and B, a lot of it's going to go right over her head. And she does look a little confused after the conversation. Like, what just happened? here what are you talking about so I think that he is a smart man and he delights in poking fun at the naivete of girls I think he delights in um, being wicked and naughty in front of girls and not have them figure him out all the time I think that that gives him sort of a sense of being above reproach I think it gives him a sense of um, corruptibility on terms in uh, on the part of him to the girls like he can corrupt them because they don't even know what they're getting into look at all these things I can say to them and they don't even know so imagine what I can get them to do and I think that that kind of gives him that kind of air that that salacious air that that air of um well wickedness really that's going undetected because you have Esther who's a staunch defender who thinks that she's in love with him you have Charlotte, who can't really figure him out. You have Clara, who knows exactly what kind of man he is, but she doesn't want people to know why or find out what kind of woman she is to know what kind of man he is. And then you have Lady Denham, who thinks that he's just basically a party boy, lazy party boy. That's what Lady Denham thinks of him. No one else really thinks anything of him necessarily. They don't really have an opinion on him. They don't really dive too much into his character. But he is an attractive guy. He is someone who can make the girl's heads turn. He is, you know, he's fit, he's funny, he's witty, he's charismatic, he's, he is outgoing. And those are all things that would uh, draw a woman to him. Even if there wasn't really a serious attachment there, women would want to be around that, right? I mean, as a viewer, you want to be around that until you remember, oh wait, <laughs> not, no, nope, that's not good, don't want that. And I think that with Edward, he does such a good job, and really Jack Fox does such a good job of hiding that aspect to his character. And, you know, he, of course, is very self-serving, like in episode one when he pulls Charlotte aside to dance, or he asks her to dance. He doesn't just pull her out. He asks her to dance, and she says yes. And um, he's saying, I saw you talking to Clara over there. What was that about? <laughs> but you won't repeat what you saw. I was simply comforting her. And uh, he doesn't say, I see you talking to Clara. He said, so you saw us in the woods the other day. I don't think you saw what you saw. Or I don't know if you think, I don't know if you know what you saw, something along those lines. But he's saying, basically, it wasn't what it looked like. 
I was merely comforting her. She was distressed and I was comforting her. And that's it. And she's like, well, it's not my business. And his response is, you're not going to tell anybody, right? Because he knows that there are certain things he can get away with, with young, immature, naive girls. But Lady Denim is none of those things. And he knows if his great aunt were to find out about any of this, and even her saying, well, no, he was out there with Clara comforting her. Lady Denim's not an idiot. And Lady Denim's going to figure out exactly what they were doing out there. And it's going to toss them both out. So while it's protecting Clara, it's also protecting, it's, it's more about protecting his own skin. So I don't think Edward was, really has, I don't think it's just as easy as he doesn't care about other people. I think it's more that he doesn't have the capacity to care about anyone else because he is a through and through narcissist. I don't think he is able to care about anybody but himself. And I think he's happy with that. I think he's okay with it. Uh, which just makes it a little worse. Which just makes his narcissism all that more glaring that he's he only cares about himself. He only has this capacity to care about himself and he's totally fine with it. And it's kind of, on one hand, it's kind of a bummer because you really want to like Jack Fox's character. You really want to happily join him on this ride of being this lovable cat. But you, you just can't. You just cannot follow along on this particular ride. And it's, <laughs> it's a bummer for us as viewers, but it, that's the way he's written. He has to be the villain of the story. He's got to be the bad guy, the wicked one, the one who nearly disrupts everything. Um, and the sad thing is, is that that was, I believe, Andrew Davies' original intention is Edward was only going to potentially and only for a short period of time interrupt the happiness of all of our leading couples. But unfortunately, it took too long to come up with a season two and, you know, through the cancellations and the moving on, Edward was the vehicle for disrupting the happiness of Charlotte City. Because, you know, yes, there was a fire, but if Edward hadn't come in, Sydney would have already proposed to Charlotte. It would have been done. He was about to do it the moment he came in. So the fire wouldn't have stopped that from happening. So Edward did single-handedly, you wouldn't be mad at anybody for ruining the Sidlot ate happily ever after. Be mad at Edward because he single-handedly disrupted that and he single-handedly is the reason why they are engaged. Other, or why they don't get engaged at that event, rather. And his timing is always bad. <gasps> oh my gosh, I gotta stop. And his timing is always been on point. Of course, not in the right way. And he has, Jack Fox is really good at the nonverbal, which means Edward is really good at the nonverbal. There's a scene in the cricket match, <laughs> in, season, in episode five at the cricket match, when um, the gentlemen are going up the bowl. It's their turn, to, it's their turn, not bowl. What is it called in cricket when you hit with the bat? Is it just, it's your turn to bat? Because that's what it is in baseball. Um, so I don't know what it's called in cricket. I know that the bowler is the guy who throws the ball, I think. I, don't, I guess I don't know that for sure. All of my knowledge of cricket comes from Sanderson. <laughs> so I'm fairly certain the one that's throwing the ball is the bowler, and the other one is up for bat. But anyway, it, did, it was the gentleman's turn to bat, and Tom hands his top hat to Edward. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that this was scripted. I, don't, I think this was an ad lib because of the reaction of the people around Jack Fox. But he just, he, Tom hands his hat. Like, he he's, doesn't even hand it forward, forward facing. Tom is standing up looking away from Edward and just takes off his top hat, hands it behind him and just expects him to take it. And Edward snatches it out of his hand like that. You can't see me if you're listening on Podbean or on any other podcast channel. But he grabs it and swings his arm in front of him and he makes like this disgusted face like, oh. and you can almost hear him go. <laughs> and that was a great, great addition to the character, I thought. And you can see that Arthur, Arthur and Babington and maybe Crow around him are laughing. So I don't know that that was really something that was supposed to happen, but that's something Jack Fox gave his character. And it was really, really interesting because it was almost like, it was like Edward saying, I'm not your servant. You don't, I don't want to have to take this crap from you, no. I mean, he does it because he does what he's told. But you know, as with Edward, he does what he's told in his own way. He's not going to be solely held over by anyone, and he will only do it as long as it serves his needs. 
And so at this cricket match, he's obviously upset because Esther's moving on to someone else. Now, I think that's an interesting thing. And we've, again, we've rehashed the Edward-Esther relationship. Uh, we went into depth about it. I think it was, I think the episode was an hour, maybe 45 minutes, but it was close to an hour. Um, but with Esther, I think really the reason he keeps her, the reason he's so intent on it, because even when Clara, and she finds the will, right? And she offers to, you know, I'll tell Esther if you don't give me a quarter share instead of a fifth. And that changes his mind. But again, I think Edward is incredibly self-serving and I think Edward is smart enough to look long game. And his long game is, well, you know, I'm going to meet somebody and going to marry, I'm going to marry someone with money, but I'm not going to be faithful to her and I'm not going to want to be with her. And eventually she might run out of money or I might just want more money. So I need a second income. Um, and that will come from Esther, I think is his thinking is that when she, because he even tells her because, you know, in episode, um, three, yeah, because he tells her on the beach right after he sees Arthur and Diane on the horses, he tells Esther, you know, we can, once we get that money, we can go anywhere we want to, anywhere your heart desires, sister. But then in episode, I think it's later on in that episode. Yeah. Um, it's episode three or four when, um, I think it's, it might be four. Anyway, I don't know why I get so caught up on which number it is, but it is the episode where Esther goes up to her, up to him and says, we could run away. You said we could, can't we, can't we just do it? And he says, eventually I will have to find a wife and you a husband. He's saying that because he's saying, you know, we're both going to have to make good matches. He's not saying because, oh, Esther, dear, you're going to have to move on and find a husband. No, he's saying that because he's saying, or at least I think, you're going to have to marry a wealthy husband. I need you to marry a wealthy husband. I'm going to marry a wife who has money, who I can get what I need from. And then you are going to marry a wealthy husband so that you can constantly fill my coffers when mine runs dry or when I need more or when she finds me cheating on her and there's a scandal. You know, you have to, I need from you. So I think that in setting up his future, in his mind, it requires him also setting up Esther's future to benefit him. I think that that's why he wants to keep Esther in his pocket. I think that's why he cares whether or not she marries Babington. I think that's why he cares whether or not she is seeking anyone other than Edward. And it's crazy when you think about it on the surface level that he doesn't want to marry Babington because Babington has money. Babington's friends with the Prince Regent. But the difference there is that Babington is an astute man. And Babington would not allow his money to be spent on Edward. He would not allow Esther to sacrifice of herself for Edward because Babington's actually a good man. And I think Edward is smart enough to understand that, no, if she marries him, she won't be able to give me what she wants. So when he seems jealous at the cricket match, to me, and maybe maybe this is not how the writers intended it, but to me, when he seems when he seems jealous at the cricket match, I think that's more of, no, that's the wrong one. I want her, I need her to not only marry well, but I need her to also be stay in my pocket, which means I need her to continue to be devoted to me, be married only in, in name and deed, but not actually wanting someone other than me. I need her to always want me. And I think he saw the real potential of her wanting Babington because Babington is a good guy. And Babington being a good guy poses a threat to Edward and poses a threat to Edward's plans for what he needs in his life going forward because that eliminates them as a money source. It eliminates the devotion of his sister. It eliminates, I mean, you have to imagine that if he was caught up in, if he married someone who was found out to be an affair and a scandal, Esther would come at it as, well, he didn't love her. He was in a loveless marriage. He couldn't help himself. It wasn't his fault. Then offer him shelter, offer him money, offer him safety. But she can't do that if she doesn't have money of her own to spend. And as a married woman, I mean, she isn't going to be as tainted She'll still be tainted. There'll still be a smirk on her name or a smudge, a smudge on her name, but Edward won't be as tainted as the other woman. So there's still that aspect of, you know, she can take care of me if something goes south. And also the addition of, you know, she's going to take care of me on top of what my new wife will take care of me, on top of what I will get from her. And I think that the only reason he didn't go for Georgiana is because, again, he is a smart man. And I think he understands that Georgiana, much like Babington, would not tolerate what he hopes to get. He hopes to live a life of ease. He hopes to live a life of 
of luxury and he hopes to live a life of everything working out for him and everything going right for him and he just firmly believes it's going to happen because he's Edward Denham and uh, what's better or greater than him so it's just going to work out that way I think he truly believes that and so with Georgiana she's not going to tell her that she's certainly not going to make his life easy she's not just going to hand over her money and say okay here you go do what you want with it husband no, she's going to make her opinions known. She's going to fight for what she thinks she needs and she's going to fight for what she deserves. Edward doesn't want anyone who's going to fight against him. Esther, he has trained her from, and that's why I want to know their background and how old he was when his mother died, how old he was when his father remarried. I want to know how long he and Esther were together because I want to know how long he had to work on her to get her to where she is because Esther's a fighting woman. I mean, we see that. We see that all through the season. It's one of the, or all through the episodes. It's one of the reasons she's my favorite character. So you have to wonder what exactly he did to get her to be so exclusively tied to him. You have to wonder what he did to convince her that nothing else was worth the sacrifice of him. I think she started to see that when Babington proposed. And I think when he when ever kissed her, I think she started to see, okay, so I'm actually not good enough for Babington. I need to let him go because I'm not good enough for him. Edward's the only one who can, who can tolerate me. Look at what I've become sort of thing. And Edward would like to keep it that way. Edward would like her to have a platonic relationship for that reason. Edward would like to have <clears throat> a wife who is going to, I would assume he wants a wife who is going to be physically appealing and uh, who would look nice on his arm. But he, I think he would like a wife that is subservient and without opinions and um, solely serving her husband. almost treating him like a deity, I would imagine, is what Edward would want, because I think Edward thinks that's what Edward deserves. And he even believes so firmly that the money is his, not not just because um, he's Edward, but why else would she choose anyone else? Uh, I'm the best candidate. I'm the guy. I'm the Denim. I'm this. But he also forgets the fact that Clara is Lady Denim's blood. Edward is not Lady Denim's blood. Lady Denham and Clara had the same... Lady Denham's maiden name is Clara's maiden name. And Edward has been nothing but a thorn, a thorn in Lady Denham's side since her husband died. So it's uh, it's not something he thought about. I mean, if I were him, I would imagine that the money would go to the first blood, the nearest blood relative, and the one who would need it to support herself. Because Lady Denham has no doubts that Clara will not be able to make a good match. I think really the main reason she's there is just to be almost like a, a lady's maid to Lady Denham, right? Almost to just do her bidding, do her will, do that sort of thing. And that's it. Whereas Edward, though poor and though having a house that's falling apart, I don't think Lady Denham realized how in dire straits he is. I think that she thinks the whole is... You know, you're just being lazy, not fixing it. Yes, you need money, though, because you are you are reliant on me. But I think she thinks she gives them a sufficient amount. I think she thinks she supplies them sufficiently. So Kara, from all intents and purposes, is the one who would logically get the money. Now, we know Lady Jen doesn't work logically. But Clara would be my choice for the inheritance, if I were Edward. That's how I would see it. But Edward is so assured. And even so... <laughs> He keeps Clara close. Now you can say he keeps her close because he talks to her all the time. He tries to um, compromise her. <clears throat> but you look at the kind of conversations that they have. And it's things like, when I inherit this house, I'm going to change the decor. You know, you might as well give up now because you're never going to get that money. And you know, that, like, that's the kind of conversation he has with her. So it's not really like he keeps her affectionately close. I think that he is trying to see where she breaks because she's a woman. I can handle this. I can taunt her all I want because she's just going to back down and give it to me. But I think, again, he's a long-term thinker, and I think that it's a double-sided thing. I think he's also thinking, but on the off chance you do get that inheritance money, look at look at me. Look at what I can offer you. Look at, look at how great of an asset I am to you. Even though he does nothing but taunt her and threaten her and <laughs> tell her she's never going to get anything. And I think that it's just, I think he is almost like 
I think Claire is the one in this show that he is actually on some level attracted to, on some level would like to be with romantically because not only is she the only one he is romantically linked to, he's not really romantically linked to Esther. That is, that physicality there is one of keeping one in tow, keeping one in line. And it is more of a control thing rather than a I want to actually be with you thing. It's, it's all about controlling her. And he knows that he can control her that way. But with Clara, he can't control her. And with Clara, she has no bones about not being a lady. And so I think that Clara is the one person in the show that he is a little attracted to. And I think it shows in what transpires in episode six or seven. Um, with the will six, it's episode six. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that he is playing both women to his advantage. I think that he sees nothing but advantage signs for him because again, narcissist, I'm Edward, I'm great, I'm amazing, I have everything to offer everyone. And I think that's, he thinks that setting up two possibilities for both girls is just a knock out of the park where he can't lose. Even though, I don't, you have to look at it logically, but a narcissist isn't logical. You have to look at it and say, well, a normal person will look at it and say, mm, well, all four of those things cannot work out in your favor. But a narcissist is going to say, I can have all the things my heart desires because one, I deserve it. And two, I'm smarter than everybody and I can make it happen, right? And he can't, but that's, that's Edward's personality. So there's this juxtaposition the whole time between him being witty and funny and him being truly wicked and it's so well done and it's so interwoven throughout the series throughout season one at least that it makes you because he is coming back we have his confirmed coming back so it makes you wonder where they're gonna go with that storyline because I don't know how you heal a narcissist I don't know how you reform a narcissist other than maybe bring them to the lowest of the low but does that do the trick because we end the season one with him being um, exiled to London, right? To be exiled, well, it doesn't, I don't know if it has to be London, but exiled out of Lady Jones' site, out of Sanditon. And I assume he's on his way to London, but you know what they say about assumptions. But he says to Clara, you know, I am a lord, I have a title, I'll be fine. She said, yeah, but you lost everything. So you have to kind of wonder if I still maintain that he joined the militia. I think that he would think that's petty work. And I think like Wickham, he would try to find a way out of it constantly. But I'm wondering if he will actually be reformed or if he will remain the villain. Because I I've thought about this so much. But what would it take to reform and redeem Edward from the years of physical and psychological abuse he inflicted on Esther? And he did. Make no bones about it. It was physical and mental abuse that he gave her. Yeah, he didn't give her a black eye, but that's not the only kind of physical abuse there is. He controlled her with physicality. He controlled her with, with physical touch and sensation. That is physical abuse. So you have to ask yourself the very real and honest question, can that be redeemed? And if so, what would that take? Would it just take a stint in the militia and an apology? Or would it take a true demonstration of, I care about other people and it's not all about me and and what would that look like would that look like him having to save an entire uh, an entire unit in the militia would it look like going to London and really truly making a difference and giving back like what what, what would that look like and his story is the one that I just cannot place where it's gonna go and obviously I'm guessing on all the other stories too I don't truly know where everything is gonna be placed but his is one that I'm really genuinely struggling to come up with a theory for because I want Edward redeemed for all the reasons I stated. He's charismatic. He's funny. He's fun to watch on screen. He's pretty. He's entertaining and he's naughty. But so I want him to redeem for those purposes. But I also can't see a way to make that work. So I'm wondering if they're going to keep him the villain. Maybe he finds some rich heiress and he marries her, takes all of her money and tries to ruin what Esther and Babington has or tries to ruin what Lady Dunham has. And, it, and if he were to do that, if he were to ruin what Esther and Babington have, it would not be out of jealousy. 
it would be out of retaliation of how dare you. I made you, I owned you, and you spat in my face. That's what it would be. It would be revenge, not jealousy, I think. So, I just... I'm trying to think of all the, all the scenes with Edward in it, and that's a long list. So I'm like, I'm struggling to come up, and then plus it's like, I don't even know what time it is right now. It's like almost 1 in the morning. It's 12.35 right now. <laughs> so I'm trying to think of all of the scenes that he's in. We kind of talked about him in episode 1. Um, obviously, he does not care about a woman's virtue. He does not care about compromising her or not. He cares about how well they can fulfill his need. He cares about how well they can service him. And of course, with Clara, Esther said that his job was to compromise her. His job was to um, get her into a position she couldn't talk her way out of. And she, quote unquote, took him to hand. But again, like I said in the last episode with the Clara and Edward, I don't think he fought it that much. He could have overpowered her at any point in time. He's bigger than her. He's stronger than her. He could have overpowered her and he didn't because it was still, no matter what it was, it was still a service to him. And Clara has experience with this. She has experience with narcissistic men. She has experience with abusive men. I'm willing to bet that she gave him some flowery words that, that painted his ego and that, that soothed his ego. And he was like, okay, you know what? I don't need to compromise you all the way. I'm going to let you do the work and then you're compromising yourself and I get something out of it too. So I think even that was himself serving. He went there with the intent of sac of uh, compromising her, of damaging her reputation. And when it became apparent that there was another option that was altogether more pleasant and served dual purposes and also included flowery words to him, I think he probably saw a, what he thought of as a better opportunity. And I think that if he could paint it to Esther as, I had no choice, you have no idea, I had no choice then she would pity him. And she even says that I will do it myself. So there's that aspect too. And I know that, I think it's it was kind of surprising for me. I don't know what it feels like for you, but it was kind of surprising to me to find out how many red flags and how dangerous the red flags are that I have with Edward. I mean, that was, that was shocking to me. So it's because he's, he is supposed to be this lovable cat. He's supposed to be this carefree, hee -hoo. you know, I'm, I'm selfish, I'm a villain, but hey, I'm a fun villain. That's kind of what he's supposed to be like. But when you look at how he's written, that's not what he is. And so in episode two, which is the dinner, it is so funny because Lady Tenham shows up to his house and he clearly does not care. I think part of me thinks that it, his idea is that, well, if Lady Denham sees where we live, then she'll give me money to fix it. Or, yeah, let her see. It's all going to be my money anyway, and I'll live at her big house, maybe. When she comes over to tell them about the pineapple luncheon, and um, he tells, um, or she says something. I don't know how it's said. But she's basically telling Edward, you know, Georgiana Lamb, she's your catch. Go after her, try to get her, and that's that's what we're gonna do from now. And she's she's your target. No, no, that was at I think that was at Lady Dunham's house. I don't know that I can't remember where that was. Guys, it is like almost one in the morning. <laughs> I can't remember where it is. And I wouldn't be doing it this late except for I have to have a corrective procedure tomorrow and I won't be available to record until past Sunday. And this is, needs to be out on Sunday, so I love you guys enough to not skip any more Sundays. Um, if you're wondering what this is, it's my stress football. I happened to watch football up here once in my, my, in my podcasting room. My stress football was up here, so now I play with it all the time. <laughs> I'm only explaining that because it just made an appearance in the video. So when she tells him, you know, Georgiana's the one to go for, he clearly is uncomfortable with it. And the reason he's uncomfortable with it, because do you look at Georgiana? She's beautiful. She is smart. We haven't seen a lot of the funny yet because she's too busy being a sullen teenager. But she's incredibly wealthy. Incredibly. She's Darcy wealthy. Okay, so huge catch. It's not odd. I mean, I said that at first it was kind of odd. But it's not really, when you look at the reality of the situation, it's not weird that he wouldn't go for her. It's not, it's not weird at all. Because she is not his type. Simply because he can't be whoever he wants to be. 
she won't be silent. She won't do what he says, how he says, when he says, and how long he says to do it. She won't do any of that. She won't jump through hoops for him. And he can't have anyone who's not going to serve him. What's the point of a wife? They aren't going to serve him because Edward, let's, let's face it, Edward does not want to be tied down. Edward does not want to stop fooling around. He doesn't want to stop being carefree, jumping from thing to thing, woman to woman. He doesn't want to stop doing any of that. So he needs a woman where he can get away with that. And you can't get away with that with someone who is observant and smart and thinks about things other than, how can I please my husband today? And that, by the way, is the kind of wife he wants. It's someone who thinks just that. Um, and in episode three, we see a little more of him when they are walking along the beach. And of course, that scene where he's reading the note from Babington, again, it's him trying to discourage Esther from being with him. It's him trying to degrade him. And I think he is also thinking a little bit, Esther, you can't have a man like this. She points it out to him. She says, what, I can't get a lord? And he's like, no, it's the mere idea that you would fancy him or favor him that I find preposterous. No, I think that he is also trying to, um, there is a hair in my nose, guys. I'm so sorry. It's like right on the edge of my nose. Um, but I think that he is trying to subtly make her think and feel that she's not good enough. Think her, make her think and feel that she can't possibly have someone that good or that great or, you know, that wealthy, that she's just not good enough. And that comes into play in episode five when he kisses her and then she tells Babington no and she's clearly upset about telling Babington no. This is the start of that, of discrediting how she feels about herself, of making her feel less than an inferior. But at the same time, it is kind of making Babington seem like this dandy sort of um, heartsick puppy. And Esther doesn't want that. Esther wants someone who's going to be strong and provide for her. And so Esther, Edward is always seeming to do two things at once in all of his interactions with people. He's looking long game and he's looking short game. And the short game here is making Babington seem like that, a fool. And the long game is making Esther think that she can't have anybody other than Edward. I mean, I'm already here. I already care for you. We're already going to be together. So this is just, this is me. This is who you're going to have. But go marry that guy so we have more money. And so that's his long game there with Esther, I think. And so when she tells him to tighten her stays, I think that is a conditioned response from her of when she starts to feel bad about herself, she needs him to make her feel like she is desirable. Like she's not just someone who is just there in the background or who is a, a pity get, sort of. And I think that Edward is very aware that he is turning her into that. So her saying, you know, come help me tighten these stays, she just wants that physical touch because he has trained her that that's how she knows she's cared for from him. And again, you have to wonder what their relationship was and what how he conditioned her for her to have that kind of response to him. I think the scariest thing about Edward is not necessarily what we see on screen, but all the things we did not see that turned him into this. And all the work he had to put into Edward, Esther and how he might have put that work in Esther to make her respond to him the way he, she does and to make her as loyal as she is. That should be the scarier part for us, the unknowns about his character. <clears throat> and so... In episode four, I don't think we see a whole lot of Edward in four. The episode four is when it's Georgia and o or Georgiana and Otis are in town, and then Sydney returns. They have their big fight. Stringer and and Charlotte go for a walk. I don't think there is a lot of Edward in four. I know there is some because there's always some, and I think. Oh, the other thing, too, is that in um, after the pineapple luncheon, when he and Esther are standing outside, he's like, I wouldn't have married her. He can, he can say that with authority because he, that's really not who he would have married. So there are some... Now, there's something that I learned very early on as a Christian was that the devil speaks in half-truth and half-lies, and that's what Edward's doing. He's speaking in half-truth and half-lie of half-truth is, I would have never married her. Of course he wouldn't, but the lie is a lie of omission saying... I could never get what I wanted with her, right? So he is intentionally being deceitful. He's good at it. You can't really tell. 
And then we see him at the cricket match with his interactions with um, how he feels about Babington and, and Esther being on the outfield together. We already talked about the kiss after the walk. But what we don't talk about is, or what we haven't talked a lot about, I don't even think we talked about it in our Edward and Clara episode, but um, when Clara comes over to him during the cricket match and she meets him over in the tent to tell him that, you know, his aunt's leaving, and he says, what is it to me? Shall I tell her that then? You know, that, that whole interaction. And Clara's taking a page out of Edward's book, right? She is doing to him what he was doing to Esther, and that is putting a seed of doubt onto his worth in him. If she can tell him or get him convinced enough that he will never make it, that he's not good enough, I think that she knows that she'll get him fawning over her. Because where Edward thinks long game and short game, always running two cons, he thinks that for completely self-serving purposes in a nefarious way, Clara thinks is always running two different things out of survival. So yes, it's self-focused, but it's because she needs to survive. Edward doesn't have the same excuse. And then episode seven is the regatta, obviously. Six is the the will and testament and the burning of that will and and um, he and Clara doing things that they shouldn't do. And then in episode seven is a clear indication of the kind of man he is when, um, and even in episode six we kind of see it when he's looking for the will and she's like, can it wait? Do we have to do it right now? And when Lady Denim is first sick and they're sitting at the table or at, around her bed and he says, can we fetch you anything? And at first it's like, oh, oh, that's sweet. And then he says, a minister or a solicitor perhaps. And even Edward is, or even Esther is like, wow, that's so not okay to ask right now. What is wrong with you? And his only response is to give her a side eye look and it's a really evil look that he gives her. And then he continues to look for the will. He continues to lie to her. He continues to um, verbally abuse her. Or, well, psychologically abuse her, I guess, is more the right term. And he just, in episode seven, it's almost like sweet vindication that he got exactly what he deserved. But then you have to think, did he really? Because, yeah, he lost Esther. But he still is Edward Denham who thinks that he is above reproach and the only reproach he got. Yeah, I mean, Lady Denham, she threw him out. Esther left him, but I feel like he deserves so much worse <laughs> for all the terrible things he did. The only reason that stopped me from really fully giving into that idea is that he's funny. <laughs> I can't help it. He's funny. I can't help it. I, I just, I, I love it. I can't, I don't know what's wrong with me. Jack Fox, you broke me. You broke my brain. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> so we see him talk to Clara and he basically is telling her, He's just trying to get one more jab. It's the thing that's partly that's what he knows by now. That's how he operates. And I think he's always seeking for holes that he can use to his advantage. And I think that's what he's doing with Clara. But Clara is, she gave into that. She allowed him to play that game. And now it no longer concerns her survival. So she's given up the fight because it's, it's not pertinent to her survival. She's not going to enter in a fight like this. She's not going to enter into something where it's, it's a battle if it's not, <clears throat> if it's not meaning surviving. But Edward is always looking for an angle to push, someone to punish, and that's what he's doing there. But it's Clara because she isn't looking for a fight, because she just is, she's given up the game because they lost, and she's, she's lost, she's accepted the loss, but he can't because I'm Edward Dunham. And so it'd be really interesting, and I think when he comes back to, in episode eight, when he comes back to the ball, it's not, it's not, Esther, I love you. I'm sorry I made a mistake. It's, okay, Clara actually said to me, the person who is most like me in this world, even though she's not completely because she's not a narcissist, but she made me see, crap, I've lost everything and now I have to start over. I don't want to start over. I want easy street. Esther, take me back because now you are the sole inheritor. I heard her say it. You have all the money. So take me back. And that's what it is. It's not, it's not a plea for her to return his affection. It's not... It's not a plea for her to return the love and care he has for her. It is a plea to <clears throat> get him out of the hole so he has no consequences or repercussions and he can go right back to Easy Street. So that is where we leave Edward. And we're going to pick up in Season 2 with 
we've only gotten hints. I still maintain militia just because of the post that Paula Byrne had said about facial hair and militia and the pictures that she had posted and all the things Jack Fox put on his Instagram of his of his mustache and his sideburns. So that's why I think militia. But I don't know. What do, what do you guys think it would take to redeem him? What do you do you guys think he is redeemable or do you think he will remain the villain? I know I want him to be redeemed, but I don't see a possibility for it. So let me know. Reach out to me. You can reach out to me at, the, at our email at the.sandersonchronicles at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram at the.sandersonchronicles or just search the Santa Chronicles. And on Facebook or on Twitter, we are at Sanderson The, or again, search for Sanderson Chronicles. If you want to join our Facebook group, we do some fun things in there. We have been trying to keep up with our posts. We each have an assigned day where we do games, we do fun things, we do, do uh, character spotlights, things like that. But we have our other podcast, which includes this one too. This one, I don't know if you know that, it's under that, that grouping of a fan and family chants or family fan clubs. We are working on something very big for all of our members, so... We've been a little preoccupied with that. <laughs> so we haven't been doing as many of the posts as we should, but we're still posting them every week. Lots of fun stuff. We have just over a thousand members. So a lot of people for you to talk to about the episodes that about Sanderson, especially when it returns. Lots of fun there. You can check us out at the Sanderson Chronicles Sanderson Family Fan Club. And as always, remember um, to give me your feedback because this is a fan-led podcast done for fans just because this fan wanted to talk about Sanderson with somebody. And I needed this outlet. <laughs> So I thank you guys for coming on and listening to this with me, for joining me in this journey. If you are watching this on YouTube, please, please, please remember to subscribe to the page and remember to watch all the videos and share the videos. <clears throat> that would be a really, really huge help to our channel and to making us something that is sustainable and more credible. If you are listening on any of our podcast platforms like iTunes, Spotify, or right from our Podbean account, Please, please, please remember to subscribe to that channel. Every subscription helps to make us more credible. Every subscription helps to make us more noticed. And the more noticed we are, the more credible we are, the better content we can give you. So please remember to do that. If you know anyone who's into Sanderson, let them know about this podcast. If you know people who are like, mm, I don't know about that show, send them this podcast. Let's let's get them on board. Let's let's build this fandom. Let's not just keep the fandom as it is. Let's build it and build it and build it until it's all that anybody can see. That's what I say. So next week, we are, I know this is a little out of order, we're supposed to be getting the recap this week, but because of my procedure um, and scheduling, Janice and I will be recording our recap episode next week, so you get episode eight next. So on that note, see you in a week. Bye-bye, guys.